Hi, my name is Ben Armstrong. Hi, this is David Koch. My name is Thomas Maurer. Hi, I'm Donna Sarkar. Hi, my name is Lana Montgomery. Hi, I'm Seth Juarez. Hi, I'm Aaron Thomas. I'm Jess Dodson. Hi, I'm Rocky Heckman. Hi, I'm Sonia Cuff. Hi, I'm Troy Hunt. Hello, this is Wally Mead. My name is Reed Purvis. Hi, I'm Lars Clean. Hi, my name is Alan Birchall. Hi, I'm Adam Fowler. Hi, I'm Sky Guthrie, and you're listening to the Need to Know Podcast. All the latest Microsoft Cloud news, as well as industry guest deep dive conversations. It's a Need to Know Podcast. All thanks to the CIA Ops patron community. The Need to Know Podcast. Catch us on Twitter and Facebook. N2K Podcast. And online at ciaops.podbean.com. Welcome along to the Need to Know Podcast. My name is Robert Crane. This is episode 300 and we are in April 2023. So let me just run through a few things from me. To start off with, please feel free to reach out to me on the email director at ciaops.com. You can also view my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash at director CIA. On the Twitters, I'm at director CIA. Also on Mastodon, if you want to reach out there as well. You can take advantage of the shared ch- Teams channel that I make available to anyone. Uh, just go to my blog and search join my shared channel that'll give you details on how to get into that environment uh, don't forget the good old merch store as well and you can become a ciops patron at ciaopspatron.com and all the good people there do help in providing uh, funds to create this sort of content now lots has happened in the microsoft space since we last spoke probably the biggest item is the new Teams client. So Microsoft has released a new Teams client in preview. So number one thing to remember here is that this is a preview client. It won't have all the features, all the capability just yet. We expect those to be added fairly quickly, but again, remember that there will be some limitations around this new Teams client. Now, there's a couple of blog posts here and articles and YouTube videos you can go in and have a look at. I'll make sure they're all linked in the show notes for you to go and take advantage of. But at the end of the day, what you should see is if you go into your current uh, Teams environment, you should find a little slider button in the top left-hand corner and that will allow you to move to the new Teams environment. Now, if you don't see that slider bar, you'll basically need to make sure, firstly, your te- your tenant is in first release option, and then you'll need to enable the developer preview uh, for your desktop client. So once you do that, the little button, a toggle up the top left-hand corner should appear. You can select the new uh, Teams environment there. Probably the biggest advantage uh, that I see is that if you go into your account, you'll see that you can add multiple uh, corporate accounts now. So it makes it easy to swap between uh, different environments here. Now, I will note that the client is much, much quicker. Generally, the first time uh, that you go there, it will be perhaps a little slow while it caches the information. But once it's done that, it is very, very quick. You're able to move between tenants without the normal tenant switching there. So again, uh, if you haven't, go in and have a look at that. You can certainly download it, but as I said, remember that it is in preview at this point in time. Uh, There is a dedicated site there. It will give you all the details behind uh, the improvements that have been made. It'll give you the information you need to go in there and get that client up and running as well as some training uh, around that. So I'll put all the links in the uh, show notes for you to go and have a look at. And there is a longer blog post here called Welcome to the New Era of Microsoft Teams that talks about uh, the Teams client. So as I mentioned, you'll be able to see all the advantage, all the improvements that they have made, number of videos there which are very good to get you up and started. And as always, remember, they're going to build on this uh, going forward. So if you haven't, go in, sign up, but make sure typically your tenant and your desktop client is in preview prior uh, to doing this. Now... What uh, Microsoft has also released is something called Windows 365 Frontline. Now, Windows 365 is the ability to get a virtual machine per user. Uh, This has been around probably for probably almost two years now, maybe. Maybe it's only been a year, but it seems that it has been around for a while. The previous licensing was one Windows 365 license per user. This new frontline allows you a ratio of three to one. So what you're able to do is create one virtual machine that three uh, independent users can use. It's designed 
for you know people working on the floor or working on shifts and whatever so again i think this is a really good option uh, particularly an smb perhaps that will help reduce the price and share the load between uh, multiple people here so i'll put a link in the show notes there the good thing from what i can see about this is that the frontline uh, version of windows 365 is really an enterprise so it's a Windows 365 Enterprise license, which means you get all the features and functionality of connecting to Azure Virtual Lands, all that really good configuration stuff in the back end, uh, which is not something we get with Windows 365 Business. So again, go in, have a look at that. This is the new Windows 365 uh, Frontline. Very similar, but I think the ability to do a effectively go a three to one ratio on a virtual machine is gonna be very cost effective and very enticing for a lot of people. Now, what we've also seen is that uh, Microsoft is moving um, away from its uh, traditional or its original or its classic uh, Microsoft Store, and it's moving into what's now called the, the Microsoft Store for Intune. So I have an article here that talks about the stages of retirement, uh, what you need to do, what's happening, how to manage these uh, sort of uh, environments going forward with Intune. Now, if you haven't looked at a service called Winget, so Winget is built into uh, Windows 11 now, uh, can also be downloaded manually. You'll find it on the command line. This is basically a package manager. It's gonna allow you to install applications, uh, keep them up to date quickly and easily, and deploy these, again, with integration into Intune. So this is really gonna be Microsoft's way going forward of deploying uh, applications. So my advice to you is um, read this article here about uh, the new uh, Microsoft Store and its integration with Intune, but then also spend some time and go and have a look at Winget uh, and what needs to be involved, how to set it up, how to use it. I find it very handy uh, if I have to rebuild the machine. It means I can do it all with a script uh, quite straightforward. So go and have a look at Winget along with this article about the uh, store changes. Now we've also got, um, or we've also had recently, a Microsoft event called Microsoft Secure. If you didn't see that, you can certainly go and view that on demand now, secure.microsoft.com, and all the sessions, or most of the sessions there, are basically available for you on demand. Now this little blog post here summarizes all the, the major announcements in there. A lot of them are around Sentinel, also some stuff there for uh, Intune. So what really grabbed me was the Microsoft Threat Intelligence. Uh, you can add this into Sentinel. This is going to take uh, indicators of compromise and put them into or integrate them into your Sentinel environment to help you be able to determine if anything in your environment is communicating uh, with a known uh, indicator of compromise. So again, certainly recommend that you go and have a look and go back through and have a look at uh, the on-demand events at uh, Microsoft Secure. Now, another thing that I've released for Teams now is avatars. Now, again, because the new Teams client uh, is in preview, it doesn't support avatars. So you've sort of got to make a choice between avatars and the new Teams client. Uh, if you have the older Teams client, you can go up and uh, enable the avatars for your Teams. They're generally enabled by default. The first thing you'll need to do is go into the apps for Teams and create your own avatar. So that'll allow you to customize it to uh, suit whatever look and feel that you want. So once you've customized that, you can then turn on uh, an avatar in a meeting. So rather than having to have your video on, you can set it up so that the avatar uh, basically takes your place. Now remember, as I said, avatars currently are only available in the uh, classic version of the Teams desktop client, not available in the new preview uh, version as yet. But again, I think I'm very keen on implementing this myself. I uh, prefer to have an avatar represent me rather than be on the camera all the time. So again, I'll put the link in show notes so you can go in and have a look at that. Now, Microsoft has announced a range of co-pilot systems. Now there's now a security co-pilot, which will allow basically you to send um, security incidents and get advice, get feedback, get information from ChatGPT. We can also, uh, we've also seen how this is gonna be integrated with things like OneNote, Word, Excel, Outlook, and so on. There's a really good video here called Explaining the Microsoft 365 Copilot System that talks about how it works, how it integrates, that I recommend uh, you to go and have a look. It's only you know up to two minutes, very short video, but again, put the link in the show notes so you can go and have a look. Now, if you do want to 
go and explain the Copilot or you've got people asking about Copilot, uh, this is a little bit of the tech behind it, help people understand how it's going to benefit their business, what the capabilities are certainly going to be. So I certainly recommend you go and have a look at that so you are across Copilot and Remember that we are going to get Copilot for productivity and Copilot for security to make our lives that little bit easier. Now, speaking of uh, security, Microsoft has announced uh, something called an Incident Responder Retainer. Now, effectively, this what this is, is prepaid incident response support directly from Microsoft. So from what I read here is you'll be able to pay for this and then take advantage of uh, Microsoft experts to help you doing during a, an incident uh, security incident so you can outsource um, them to do hunting and give you resolutions and help you uh, better deal with an incident in your environment now I haven't seen any pricing on this very interesting uh, that is coming out it's an indication of Microsoft sort of pushing into uh, traditional reseller space I suppose offering the capability and their experts which makes sense that they want to resell this and get full advantage of that so they're providing an on-demand service called um, you know incident responder retainer Go in and have a look at that. Uh, I think at the moment it's currently only available typically in the enterprise, but I would expect eventually to be available in SMB as well. So uh, be aware of that service that is now available from Microsoft. Now, one of the other things I've seen in the security space is a lot of people are still under a misapprehension that the built-in uh, Windows Defender that comes with every version of Windows isn't adequate. Uh, here's an article here that uh, indicates Microsoft has awarded the best advanced protection for corporate and consumer users. Uh, this is a really good representation of the fact that Microsoft has put a lot of work into all of its security products, including the free default one that comes with Windows, and that is now up to you know the highest level, the highest standard. So again, if you do have people who say, well, I, you know, Microsoft doesn't make a good AV product, uh, I would point them towards this article. And again, the article will be in the show notes for you to go and have a uh, look at. All right, so we also have a new Microsoft uh, Intune devices experience. So one of the criticisms of Intune is that it can be a little bit cluttered. It is very corporate. Uh, there's a lot of information, you know, um, packed into one page there. So Microsoft is beginning to improve the look and feel of this. The first start, I think, is this new device preview. So when you go and look at the devices in Intune, you'll be able to uh, select a little option at the top. There'll be a little banner at the top that says, do you want to move to this new uh, preview? I would select yes. I think it's really good. Uh, it breaks things out, puts it in nice little tiles that you can select on. Again, the details are in the article, which I'll provide for you. So I think this is a step towards you know, Microsoft uh, revamping the Intune portal and make it a better look and feel for most users and most improvements. So... I would certainly go and have a look at that. I turn the new experience on to get a feel of what it's going to be like uh, because I'm pretty sure this will become the default moving forward. So that's a new uh, device experience in Intune. Uh, the look and the feel is changing slightly. Now, speaking of Intune, there's an article here uh, about what's new in Intune for uh, March. Uh, lots of new updates for the admin center. Um, you know, device preview, autopilot's been improved, uh, Azure AD shared device benefits for frontline workers with Apple devices. Uh, again, so if you are in the Intune space, if you are in the device management space, I'd certainly recommend that you go and have a look at this, keep up to date with what's happening in Intune. It is uh, moving pretty quickly and adding a lot of features. And one of the other things that they have added recently is the uh, ability to do privilege escalation. So privilege escalation will be part of the Intune, new Intune suite, but it is available in preview uh, now. So you can go in and have a look at it in your endpoint manager, set it up and use it, play around with it. I have written a number of blog posts recently on how to use it. So go in, check my blog at blog.ciaops.com, get an idea of what this is. So. Uh, my advice would be if you want to have a look at it, do it now while it's in while it's free before there is a cost associated when it goes to uh, GA. Now another little interesting article I found here is how to enable Microsoft Authenticator Lite for Outlook Mobile. 
So there are situations where users don't want to put an additional app on their device, especially if it's BYOD, so they don't want to put the Microsoft Authenticator app for some strange reason on their devices. Um, this way you can actually go in and set up Outlook on the mobile device to be the actual authenticator. So when a code or when an approval process for access to the Microsoft 365 environment is required, you can use Outlook to do this. So the article that will be posted here will show you how to go and set that up. It's a little bit technical, I must admit, um, but if you really want to do this, it's not that difficult. You just copy and paste and, and off you go to the races. So I will make sure the article is available for you. So if you have the need to set up an authenticator, but not using the Microsoft app, but using, for example, Outlook instead, which users should have on their device, especially their BYD, I think this is a, a really, uh, a really good option to go and uh, consider there. So again, the article will be in the show notes for you to um, go and have a look at that. So what I thought we'd talk about in uh, this episode here was Microsoft Azure. So what I find out there is a lot of people have a lot of hesitancy or are scared or don't really understand the benefits that uh, Azure can provide their environment. Now, the first thing to remember is that uh, every time you set up Microsoft 365, you'll get an Azure tenant in the background. Now, the Azure tenant is going to typically manage your users and your groups. Now, you can get to that uh, by going to entra.microsoft.com. That's basically going to be the dedicated portal, the dedicated identity portal. So Entra is Microsoft's new uh, overarching uh, product name for its identity. And in here, the major component is going to be Azure Active Directory. In here, you'll be able to see all your users. You'll be able to look at the groups, devices, everything you can uh, basically see. You'll also see permissions management, verified ID inside Entra as well. Now, if you go into the Azure AD portal by portal.azure.com and then click on the Azure Active Directory icon, you'll see basically the same thing, but in a older style um, environment here. So you'll see that, again, lots more options in here, but that's how you could work with uh, Azure AD. So again, think of your Azure um, environment, the Azure portal, as a way to um, you know go in and have a range of additional tools that you can access. Now, the basis of it is you're going to have a, a tenant in there, but that tenant's only going to have free services in there. So Azure AD, um, some very basic services. Now, there's certainly a lot in there you can do with those free services, but you get the most benefit when you start putting in a subscription. So you can purchase an Azure subscription, and I would certainly recommend that you think about purchasing an Azure subscription with every single Microsoft 365 environment that you do sell or you do implement. Because remember that the billing with Azure is done on consumption basis. Now, what that means is that you will not be charged anything until you start using some of the paid services in Azure. So there's nothing really stopping you putting in a version or a subscription for Azure, and you'll only start being billed once you start consuming services from that environment. So get it done, get it put in there, and that's going to give you the flexibility. And some of the items we'll talk about here shortly. Now, apart from Entra, which has you know those free capabilities, user management, uh, that sort of thing in the back end, where I would start typically would be DNS. So one of the things many people do not appreciate is that Azure supports the ability to set up DNS zones. So you can go in and you can you know create an environment as you would. Uh, with many name uh, domain hosters. You'll see in here that you can go in and set up all your domain records. Now, back in the day, I started using Azure DNS because I wanted to create or use DMARC records. Now, my existing domain provider didn't support the underscore character, which you typically need for your uh, DMARC capability, right? So the idea was is that I moved to Azure. Now, what I found is that Azure DNS has a number of benefits. A, it's very, very quick because it's a distributed network managed by Net Microsoft on you know, its large network. It's also configurable using a script. So I can set up, I have a PowerShell script that allows me to create all the DNS records very quickly and automatically. Uh, so this is very handy when I've got to set up a demo environment. So if I need to set up you know, a demo environment that's linked to a custom domain that I've got, I can use a script to go through and do all that uh, using PowerShell. Now, the other reason that I really like um, Azure DNS is the fact that I also get this uh, capability 
to have reporting. So in one of the dashboards I've created here in Azure, I can look at the query volume of the DNS for the records that I have. Uh, and that's going to give me an indication of you know what's going on in the background, how many people are querying the site, uh, and so on. Now, the reality here is that, of course, once you start using uh, Azure DNS, there will be a cost associated with that because you are consuming Azure services. Now, in my experience, that cost is roughly going to be a couple of dollars per month, simply because remember that DNS is a distributed name service, which means not every request for the domain is hitting the home or the primary DNS service. They're being cached, cached throughout the environment. So you're only going to get a relatively small amount. So that's going to be much controllable. Generally, what I found is for most uh, you know, a typical cost for a, uh, a domain is going to be in the 3 to $4 range, if that. Sometimes, uh, for example, some of my demo uh, domains here are costing less than $0.40 cents a month. So it's a very, very cheap way to do it. And you get the monitoring, you get the capability, you get the scriptability as well. You can manage it all in an environment. So perhaps the best practice to consider is, is that you buy a customer, a Microsoft 365 environment, you add an Azure subscription in there automatically, then when they're ready, you move their DNS records in there and manage them. You get nice speed, nice um, you know performance. You can also set up metrics and view that. And importantly, if you ever need to hand off that tenant, you can hand off the whole thing, including the DNS records. That has been a challenge for many people who have their DNS records in another uh, name provider. When a customer leaves, they've then got to give them or work out how to hand off those name records. So again, I think Azure DNS has a you know, huge amount of uh, capabilities and flexibility for most people. It's a really cheap way to get started with Azure as well. Now from there, you can also look at things like storage. So storage accounts give you the capability to store all sorts of information in here. You can uh, store you know, blobs, which are binary large objects. But the place I would suggest you think about starting is what's known as the Azure File Service, okay? So the idea here is with an Azure File Service is that you can basically set up a share to this Azure storage location, which you can map a drive to. Now you can do that securely using SMB3. So what I've done typically is created an Azure um, storage area for and created a file share in there. All right, so if I go in and have a look here, you'll see that there are a number of directories in here. Now, typically I will put, for example, backups of this podcast. I will put uh, software ISOs, things that I need to access regularly, pseudo regularly. So one of the reasons I originally created this was to hold all the ISOs for old versions of SharePoint back to SharePoint 2003 if I ever needed to do migrations. Now, I didn't want to have to hold those on you know, some sort of storage here. I also wanted them accessible uh, via the web so I could set this up at you know, any point uh, in time. And I also wanted them to be quick. So having them in Azure, typically I'll be spinning up a SharePoint server in uh, an Azure virtual machine. Therefore, if the Azure storage is also uh, in the same location as the machine, then that means that the access is really quick and it spins up you know, really fast. So it's also really good for using things like backups or archives. So let's say that you are migrating an on-prem environment into SharePoint Online. Things that don't work in SharePoint that aren't indexed, that don't provide a lot of value, let's think PST files, let's think large JPEGs, maybe some other large files which don't really provide value in SharePoint Online and will simply consume space, may be a better bet inside an Azure file, uh, files environment because you can always access them, map them, you can secure them, you can integrate them with Azure AD and so on. So um, I would start, like I said, with DNS and then I would look at uh, talking about or using the storage capabilities. Now the cost of storage, again, this is a consumption-based service. So it is going to vary slightly on you know, what tier of storage, so how fast the access. So we have you know, cool tier, cold tier, and hot tier, depending on uh, you know, how regularly or how quickly you want that access, and also the size of so the amount of information that you do uh, say. But as an indicator, I think I have around four terabytes of space as a, you know, a cloud server, in inverted commas, uh, and that's costing me, you know, ten, maybe twelve dollars uh, a month to maintain that on a regular basis and uh, get access to that anyway. So I think that that's quite a good uh, compromise for that. And again, you can think of that as a way to uh, archive information that you may 
uh, need, but it's not a, a priority. Again, I put my MP3s from these podcast recordings and so on in that sort of archive as well. So that's a great option there. So again, DNS is a starting point and then consider our storage. Now, the next one, which I think is probably the big one, I'd certainly recommend this to everybody, is Azure uh, Microsoft Sentinel. That is an Azure service. So we've talked about this uh, before in a previous podcast. But in essence, what you do is you set up uh, Sentinel, which is a large bucket for all sorts of logs from different data sources. So from Microsoft 365, from Defender for Endpoint, uh, from uh, you know uh, firewalls and so on, third-party products, AV. And that will accumulate all the logs and then run a number of queries across them on a regular basis and allow you to take actions. It has workbooks, Power BI dashboards and so on. I think that it is the security tool that everybody should implement in their environment. Uh, Again, this is an Azure service. It's billed on consumption. So you basically pay for the amount of data ingested, the storage, how long it's stored, and also the analytics, the queries that you run across it. However, there are a lot of capabilities in there that will be provided for free. So a lot of Microsoft connectors are free. You get 90 days worth of storage for free. Uh, and so on. Another good thing about Sentinel is you'll get a 30-day free trial. So I don't think there's any limitation on setting that up anywhere. Now, once you set up Sentinel, um, I use this in a demo environment, many demo environments, and in a production environment. For example, the demo environment, which is largely focused on Microsoft uh, connectors and working within the boundaries, the limits that Microsoft provides for free, it's cost me four to five dollars a month for you know a couple of hundred thousand worth of logs. In my production environment, I'm sucking in a huge amount of data, including all the Windows security event logs for all my devices. Uh, so it's about twelve or so devices that I've got. That's costing me roughly, you know, four to five dollars a month to achieve that, right? And a lot of that is just ingesting of those security logs. Now, if I took that out, uh, which is an add-on I've selected, it's going to cost me, you know, probably a dollar, if that, uh, probably thirty cents or so uh, a month per device. So, remember that you can determine the amount of information, and that cost will be reflected in that. And you do get a, a significant amount uh, for free in there as well. Now, another service that I have spoken about um, that is not aware, uh, that most people are not aware of, is something called Defender EASM. So think of Defender EASM roughly as an external vulnerability and pen testing tool. You basically create an environment inside your Azure, and then you give it what's called some seeds. Now, the seeds are typically an email address, IP of your network connection, maybe a website. It will then take those spider out and report if any of the uh, items connected to that are vulnerable. So think, you know, out of date SSL certificates on web servers. Think of uh, vulnerabilities on routers. But the point with Defender EASM is that it's an external uh, looking or looking into your environment uh, service. It's as though, you know, this is basically what the attackers see. Now, I've set that up. I put in six seeds in my production environment, email address, IPs, and a website. And it's come back from those six or so. It's found about 600 assets linked to that. Uh, it's assessing all those, giving me a report daily on that. Now, the cost to that is roughly about 3 to $4 a month. Again, uh, the cost is based on how many assets are discovered. You can manage and do that. But again, for a few dollars a month in combination with Sentinel. So I think of Sentinel as the internal uh, vulnerability analysis and Defender EASM as the external uh, you know, vulnerability testing those two combined for, you know, a total cost of, you know, 10 or $20 a month, I think is a really worthwhile uh, investment. So if you haven't had a look at it, do a bit of reading about Defender EASM. Now, of course, the other thing we get in this environment is our good old virtual machines with Azure. Now, these are standalone virtual machines. I'm using one to do demos here. If you are watching the video recording of this, uh, it allows me to spin up a demo machine. The good reason to do that is that I can have an environment which is secure, on demand, just in time. I can put all my scripts on there. I can be a little uh, less uh, secure, I suppose. It's not connected to my environment. Uh, It means that also if I need to rebuild it, I can quickly and easily. So if I need to do PowerShell these days, I lock down my environment so tightly that it becomes very difficult to achieve that. Much easier to spin up a virtual machine on demand with all my scripts on it, run the PowerShell that I need, close the virtual machine down. I can do that anywhere, anytime, on any device. So 
Again, I really find a virtual machine is really good as an admin style workstation for various uh, different reasons. So you can use a virtual machine for lots and lots of things, but my advice to you is, is think about it in that sort of on-demand capability. Running a virtual machine over a long period of time does end up being uh, very expensive depending on how much disk. So one of the virtual machines that I have that I do demos on is actually a Hyper-V machine with you know four uh, disks and whatever to run virtual uh, guests in as well. Now that is can be very expensive. If I left that running 24 by 7, I'd probably uh, burn you know any credits that I have very very quickly. So I only use that when I do demos, and again the costs are manageable if I do it in that sort of environment. Now some other things that Azure can give you if you are um, interested is um, Azure Virtual Desktop. So Azure Virtual Desktop is, I suppose, the enterprise version of um, Windows 365. It's a pooled environment, more like an art, traditional uh, on-prem RDS server. I've got some videos on my YouTube channel on how to set that up, how to manage that, how to work with that. So have a look at that as well, but you can do all that inside Azure as well. Lots and lots of power in there if you want. Now, the other thing that I have been playing with recently in here is the IoT. So I'm um, trying to get my IoT devices to connect to Azure to do you know things as an experiment. So don't forget IoT uh, is in here. But if you go through the Azure environment here and you look at all the services, you'll see there are probably thousands of individual services that you can set up. There's cognitive services, AI, um, you know, there's all sorts of, Azure Arc is another one, SQL, API management, all sorts of things in here. So the takeaway I would suggest to you is that think of Azure as your on-demand uh, data center and think of it as your you know, infrastructure toolbox. You can really go in here and pull some really powerful tools in here and only pay for what you use. Now, yes, there are advantages and disadvantages with a consumption-based pricing versus um, you know, a flat fee per month with Microsoft 365 is. However, the reality is used intelligently and if you understand the billing, you can come out with some very, very cost-effective services. So the two that I would point to, uh, apart from DNS, would be the uh, Sentinel, without doubt, the security tool that everybody should have in the environment, since it is the one place all the logs can be aggregated. And I would also suggest that um, it is also the place um, that you can use for Defender EASM as well, all right? So the idea here is that there are a lot of tools in there that you can use. A lot of these come with a 30-day trial as well, so you can get up and get started or get them in environments, show people the benefit of them, and then basically you can build from there. So if you haven't had a look at Azure, go and do that. Remember, you do get an Azure environment for free with a number of free tools. You'll find that at portal.azure.com. Log in with the same account you're using with your Microsoft 365 environment to get advantage of that. And if you want to use some of the paid services, you'll need to put a paid subscription in there to take advantage of them. All right, so with that, I think that's probably enough for this episode of the Need to Know podcast. I'm going to take this opportunity to Thank you for being part of today's episode. And don't forget, you can access the resources that I have at my blog, blog.coapps.com. You can also go to GitHub, where I have a number of scripts there. And also, don't forget tutorials I have on my YouTube channel, SlideShare. And thank you very much for listening to the podcast. And of course, thanks to the patrons for providing uh, the ability for me to provide this sort of content to the wider audience for free. You can always reach out to me via the many means of uh, connection. Typically, email director at coops.com is the best option. Otherwise, you can also uh, access or you can grab me on uh, the Twitter at director CIA. So once again, I'll take this opportunity to thank you very much for watching this episode of the Need to Know podcast. You have been listening to the Need to Know podcast from CIA Ops. For training on using technologies like SharePoint Online or Microsoft 365, visit www.ciaopsacademy.com. By purchasing from the selections available, you'll be directly supporting this podcast. To provide feedback on this episode, visit www.ciaops.com contact.